Last night when I was preaching in the revival, it, it was really heavy on my heart about uh, time running out and people's last chance. And I want to say, say something about that this morning. In the days of Noah here in Genesis 6, the Bible talked about how wicked the world had gotten. And there were probably millions of people on the earth at this time. I don't know, somebody had it figured out one time that probably could have been millions of people. Now, Noah, because people lived so long back then, was just about contemporary of Adam. And those, a lot of those guys knew each other, living, you know, six and seven, eight, nine hundred years. Now, the question comes up, did people really live that long in the Bible or is they just mistaken, didn't know what they're saying, or the count of years? Yes, they really did. Time, things were different before the flood. Before the flood, everything, the way the world was watered, the canopy, all the, everything, everything was different. The weather was different before the flood. So that's why they lived six, seven, eight, nine hundred years. You'll notice if you read your Bible, right after the flood, lives started getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Now we're down to 70 or 80, and if you're really doing good, 90, something like that. Very few make it past that. So they, they were getting wicked. The world had got extremely wicked. And the Bible said, look at verse 1, it came to pass when the men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. You know, we're not going into all the sons of God and daughters of men. Skip down there to verse 5 for time's sake. And God saw, God saw, make no mistake about it, people, God sees. He saw you last night. He saw you Friday night. Don't think you're pulling nothing over on him. He's got you. He's got you on camera, video, surveillance. See this guy on, on the news? We're going to read a little bit more. Right here in Burke County somewhere, tried to steal a, 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 a uh, swing off somebody's fence, a uh, porch, real expensive swing, and he stole it and put it in the back of his truck, and they got him right on camera, man. There he is. His face. You, you better be careful nowadays if you're going to go out robbing stuff. Somebody got a camera pointing on you. Good, good. But God's got one that sees in the dark and sees everywhere. God saw, God saw, verse five, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. What do you think God thinks about it now? They didn't have internet. They didn't have HBO. They didn't have uh, Flocka. I don't reckon. They didn't have uh, all this stuff. They might have. Uh, they, I'm telling you, it's full of the devil though, buddy. They got wicked. And every, look at this, imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That means the world got so bad, people, that every thought people had was some old dirty, wicked thought. I've had people tell me, say, Brother Danny, I work with a bunch of old men at work and they, nothing, everything that happens, they want to make some dirty joke out of it. Every person that walks by, the thoughts of their imagination was only evil continually. Now, if you're sitting here tonight and you got a dirty, filthy mind, you know what you need to do? Get it clean in the blood of Jesus. Are you dirty mind sitting out here this morning, you've been looking at filth, you've been looking at junk on your phone that ain't right, get it right. Don't tell me you can't quit. That's a lie. You can if you want to. You can quit anything if you want to bad enough. And they were, the Bible said the thoughts of their heart was evil continually. So the Lord said this in verse seven. He said, I will destroy man that I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I've made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, he built the ark, and in verse 7, chapter 7, verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for I have seen, uh, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this evil generation, uh, in this generation. So God told him, build a boat. Only hope you got, Noah, build that boat. I'm wiping everybody else out. And so Noah went to work, and God gave him 120 
years. Build a boat. That time was up. God said, come in the ark. And when the Bible, the Bible said that God shut Noah in. God shut that door. You know what that meant? When God shut that door, nobody else was getting in. Nobody in was getting out. It was done. Once that was done, that ship sailed on the top of that water and it was over. That's where they were saying they missed the boat. You remember that? That's where that comes from. They, them people missed the boat. And buddy, they laughed and no doubt made fun of Noah all them 120 years. But when that water began to come up like that, don't listen to the skeptics. There's some fool get on TV and laughs some ignorant person like these common t- and, and talk show hosts and scientists and stuff and they're, they're ignorant, willfully ignorant what the Bible says. I'm not to being ugly, the Bible says that. Willfully ignorant that the world stand in the water and out of the water and all that stuff. They're ig- ignorant on purpose and they'll say, oh my goodness, you can't tell me the whole world was underwater. Yes, it certainly was. You say, Brother Danny, there's no way Mount Everest is 17,000 feet. It is now. Can't prove it was then. You know why mountain ranges are always near the coast? You know why all them Rocky Mountains are out there in California this morning and the the Blue Ridge Mountains here on the the east side? Because on the plates of the earth, when all that water come in, like if you got a plate like this, something gave way down here and went boom. So when something goes down, something else goes up. Have you ever been to the mountains and see them rocks? They're, they're not straight like this. God didn't make them like that. They're crooked. Something pushed them things up. And the Bible said, somebody said, well, there's no way it could rain enough in 40 days and 40 nights. That ain't what he said. It didn't say all that water came from rain. It said the fountains of the great deep were opened up for 150 days. That's what trouble you get into when you don't read it. And 150 days that water went up and prevailed and brother, that thing got all out of whack and this old world rocked and real. I mean, like a drunk man driving down Main Street. This old world shook and it jerked and it went back and forth and brother, that thing, that thing, uh, uh, the ark landed on top of that. One man said, now you can't tell me that Noah, he couldn't have got all of them animals in that ark. First time somebody says that to you, say, ask them how many animals they are. They have no idea. Ask them how big the ark is. They don't have no idea. They're just saying, somebody said that, and they thought, oh, that's a cool argument so I can get drunk. He couldn't have got all them animals in that little ark. I can check up now. Woo! Guess what? Your party's over, dude. Uh, You you ain't going nowhere. Uh, God, and somebody said, there's no way he could have got all them species of animals. He didn't say species. He said, kind. Read your Bible. Kind. And there is, and did you know that like 75% of all the animals in the world live in the water? And they didn't need to get in a boat? And about a, a bunch of, the other 25% is insects, about that big. And every kind, there's not that many big animals. One guy told a preacher, I think it's Kent Hovind, one of them guys, he said, now, he said, now, preacher, he was an evolutionist. He said, you can't tell me that you believe that all the different varieties of dogs in the world came from them just six dogs, uh, dog kinds in that ark. You can't tell me that. Uh, that's, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard, that all the dogs come from them six dogs. He said, listen, man, you believe that all the dogs in the world come from a rock. That's what they believe. They believe that molten lava and soup and everything was on a rock and it evolved and all that and people come out of soup. I'm telling you, don't don't talk to us about silly stories. Don't talk to us about silly uh, Bibles and fairy tales and myths like that. That Bible says God sent the flood and you can take it to the bank, buddy. God sent the flood. The earth all over this world bears the marks of a catastrophe all over this world. Go, look at the deserts. Look at the, uh, look at the mountains. Look at that. He didn't make it like this. People say, oh, look at this beautiful world God made. He didn't make it like this. This is just the after part of after sin came in the world. It knocked your eyes out. It's like people say, look at all the beautiful people God made. Please don't blame all this on God. 
I, I'm telling you, brother, this sin's what got us looking like us, looking like this. God wouldn't make a mess that looks like it's sitting in here this morning. Say amen right there. That's right. Uh, he made it, Adam and Eve, now they look good. After sin came, then came all the flaws and all the other. But anyway, back to our story. I'd like to preach on God's last train for heaven. God's last train for heaven. Years ago, people went and traveled by train and they'd go down there and they'd get on that train and the train would leave. And they'd go like from Charlotte to Texas or somewhere. And uh, sometimes you'd go down there and you'd go down and say, I come and I got my ticket for the train. They'd say, sorry, train done left. The train's done left. You talk about a shock. You talk about a surprise. I, I fly uh, a lot of times to preach different places and I got fly to Florida or I'll fly, I'll fly. I've, I've been to California and Colorado and Texas and New York and everywhere preaching and every time, you know what them planes don't do? They don't wait on you. They don't wait on you. They announce there's a time up there that that thing's gonna depart. I don't care, brother. You can tell them I had a flat tire. I went down Interstate 85 before and there'd be a wreck. Something honest. I went over in the grass and, and don't tell nobody that. Uh, and, and, and everything, trying to get around the traffic, trying to, uh, trying to make a flight before it left. They don't wait on you. There, it happens every day in this country. People come running up saying, eh, wait, and they'll say, sorry, plane gone. Gone. Your chances of getting on that plane's over. They're gone. I'm, here's what I want to say this morning. There's people sitting in this room today that this could be your last chance to get right with God. I'm serious as I can be. That day came when God gave them. You say, boy, preacher, I take vitamins and I work out and I don't, that don't mean nothing. That don't mean nothing. I preached about that girl last night down there in that revival that I, I heard who was training for the Olympics and she was only like 17. Training to be an Olympic runner. Perfect health, perfect heartbeat, perfect blood pressure, cholesterol, triglycerides, uh, blood sugar, all that stuff. Perfect, 17 years old. She's staying with her granny down there in Mississippi and she came in one day during the summer and she said, Mama, I got a headache. She said, well, take some of this Tynol and go up there and lay down and take you a nap. So she goes upstairs and lay down and take a nap. She, like, she never did come down, never did come down. Her grandmother goes up to check on her and she goes in that room and she's stiff. 17, y'all. 17 years old, gone. It's had an aneurysm. That's a blood vessel burst in your head. You say, oh, Brother Danny, I've got plenty. You don't know you've got plenty of time. There is not a person in this room today that knows you're gonna be alive at five o'clock today. None of you, me included. This may be, you say, well, my goodness, I don't go to church to get to be told that. You need to. Because it's a fact. It's a fact. It's a fact. The Old Testament prophets continually warned people. I don't believe Noah stood out there day after day and said, Something's wonderful coming in your future, like preachers today do. He could have took up a good offering, but he's a false prophet. I don't believe Noah sit out there and say, something good is going to happen to you, happen to you. No, he didn't. He didn't come and say, God's got something very special for y'all. He sure did. I'm telling you, buddy, listen, it ain't all just have fun and pat each other on the back. You say, well, I go to church for the preacher to make me feel good. Now, once in a while, I mean, we, we, we get cheered up here now, and we was getting cheered up here a while ago. But the whole hard, cold truth is we are a dying bunch of people, and you never know when your last change is going to be. Never know. You can get snuck up on. I heard about this guy the other day. He said he... Uh, uh, went out to get a cab. He's in a big city. You know, you just do like that and a, and a cab. You just wave at somebody and a cab will stop, like in New York. And you raise your hand up like that, cab stopped. He jumped in the back seat and got in. The driver just took off. And he'd gone down a couple of blocks. And he thought, well, I better tell him where I want to go. And he reached up there and patted that driver on the back, said, hey, buddy. And that guy went, ah! 
and they got and floored the car and, hit, and run up on the curb and hit a, a light pole and wrecked and everything. And he said, ha, ha, ha. And he said, oh my goodness, man, I didn't mean to startle you like that. I'm so scared. He said, that's all right, man. He said, he said I drove a hearse for 20 years. <laughs> he said, this is my first day driving a car. I'm not used to that. I mean, like they had a heart attack. And you know, I, I snuck up on him like that. And ladies and gentlemen, we don't know. You, you, you've heard the old saying, you can put your shoes on this morning and the undertaker will take them off you for the days of. They might have your box or mine laying over there at that funeral home right now. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just saying they had opportunities. They had opportunity. I, 120 years. They had 120 years. I believe Noah preached. The Bible said he was a preacher of righteousness, so I'm, I'm assuming he preached. He's a preacher of righteousness. He preached. He preached. And when they worked on that boat, they had that big old thing laying up there, buddy. I mean, big old three-story ark. That thing's humongous. I don't know if any of you have been to the one up there in, in, in Kentucky. Up in Louisville, I've never been. I've seen a lot of pictures of it and stuff. And everybody I say, everybody I know who's went is just blown away, just amazed. They say there's nothing, there's just, there's no way you can fathom that till you see it in person. And it makes it real and makes that story real. It shows how they had the different compartments. It shows how they had water and sewer system and everything. Noah designed that on the ark. And so that the animals could be taken care of and the food bins and, and everything. And can you imagine that thing sitting out there in dry land? Can you imagine? Now, let's just go back in our imagination for a minute to way back yonder, 4,000 B.C. No electricity, no kind of, I mean, they just sawed with hand, handmade saws and, and they had big old uh, saw horse about as big as this table here. They brought that, that wood there and put them big old logs on there. Noah and his three boys, as far as we know, Unless he hired help, he might have done that. But Noah and his three boys pulled themselves back and forth, pulled themselves back and forth, and they laid those, those big old logs on that boat. Can you imagine now? I mean, put yourself in those days. All the people in town come out, and they said, have you heard about, hey, have you heard about that preacher? There's a preacher, gets out and preaches every day, crazy nut. He preaches, and he's building a boat, and there ain't no water in 40 miles of here. I mean, there ain't no water nowhere around. What is that fool doing building a boat out there? Can you imagine how stupid he must have looked? You know, the Lord always does that. For some reason, God allows his way to look stupid in the eyes of sinners in the world. And they're blinded. And it's also, that's a good lesson for me and you. You know, there's people that are Christians in this world today They'd die before they'd go to a church like this where we scream and holler and preach on hell. They they don't want to look stupid to the world. They don't want to look, oh my goodness, I don't want people to think I'm crazy. Well, you better get used to it if you're the Lord. What do you think I thought about Noah? Here's that thing halfway built. He's been working on it 75 years. And his wife goes downtown to the dollar store and she's going to get them some stuff, some bread and ham and cheese and stuff. And tape, And she's in there, and there's two women. They say, that's his wife. That's his wife right there. That's his wife. And they went over and said, honey, I feel so sorry for you. Don't, don't you, ain't you tired of letting that old man boss you around? Be like us. We're liberated. Us women, we might not, we're not even women no more. We don't know what we are. Come and be like us. And Noah's wife said, God. You people weird, get away from me. And they said, but Mrs. Noah, don't you think it's crazy? Are you really gonna get in that boat with him? I mean, I believe you should love your husband, but my goodness, you, you should think for yourself. Don't let no man boss you around. What's wrong with you? And she said, my husband said it's gonna rain. And they said, what's rain? She said, it's when drops of water are falling out of the sky. <laughs> drops of water fall out of the sky. Look, we lived here all our life. Mamma lived here. Grandpa lived here. 75 years. It ain't never, there ain't no water never fell out of the sky. Ever. It had never rained, y'all. Think how hard that was to take that stand with her husband. But she said, my husband, this is why it's important for you men to be right. 
She said, my husband is God's man. And if he said God told him, I believe him and I'm standing with him. They said, honey, Tammy Wynette said that and it didn't work out too good for her. She said, who's Tammy Wynette? I don't listen to that junk. And they said, oh, well, well you, you, wouldn't know, you wouldn't know the difference. They said a lot worse after she died and, uh, or before she, after she got gone off the scene. Uh, but anyway, it got worse and worse and worse. They had Noah, they had Noah on, uh, I don't even know who does it now. They had him on, I don't know, Dr. Phil. And they had Noah on there. And he said, today we have the preacher sitting on our panel right here today, folks, that believes that water is gonna fall out of the sky and drown everybody that don't believe like he believes. Boo! Can you imagine screaming out the... <laughs> Oh my goodness, you judgmental. That's why people don't go to church. You're too judgmental. And Noah just sat there and said, I I, I, I didn't say a word. And they said, listen, sir, are you telling us that everybody that don't believe like you believe is literally gonna drown? Hand in the mic. He said, no. And they said, "Well, well, what are you saying? He's saying, I'm saying, God said he's gonna drown the world with a flood. And they said, oh, so you're saying that everybody that don't belong to your church is, is going to drown? No, you deaf. They said, well, what are you saying? He said, I'm saying God said that he will drown this world with a flood and he told me to build that boat. And said, I'm just telling you what he said. And they said, well, what makes you think you're right and everybody else is wrong? He said, I didn't say that I was right. Are you deaf? I didn't say I was right and everybody else was right. I said, God Almighty that made this world said it's gonna happen. Now listen, people. Therein lies the problem of our generation of Christianity. You can't open your mouth without somebody screaming discrimination. Somebody screaming you're judging. Oh, you think all religions are the same. No, they're not. I'm nothing. I am nobody. I don't claim to be nothing. I'm a sinner that ought to be in hell. But I'm telling you, God Almighty said that he's gonna burn this world up the next time with fire and there's a heaven, there's a hell and just as sure as you're sitting in that chair, that's the truth because God said it, not because Danny said it. I'm just telling you what he said. Just telling you what he said. And they had a rabbi and a priest and a, a female pastorix. You'll see tonight. And they had a Hindu Shama, Rama, Tama, <laughs> Dalai Lama, something or another. And, and, they had, and they had all these religions there. And they said, well, what do you guys say? And every one of them said, he's wrong. All the religions in the world agreed against the truth. I don't have time to talk about it this morning. We will tonight. But that is exactly what's happening in our world this morning. All the religions in the world are getting together on what they can agree on against the truth. No doubt. No doubt. I believe God gave them one Last warning. Last one. God said, 75 years you didn't come in. 80 you didn't come in. 90 you didn't come in. I've heard people say, well, uh, what? they couldn't have got saved. No, but yeah, they could. Anybody back there could have got saved. You can't tell me God wouldn't have had mercy. If that old crowd would have been, he'd have made another plan and built a bigger boat and left the animals out and created them later. He could have done all kinds of things. Don't you tell me God fixed it so only Noah and his family could have been saved. I don't believe that. That's crazy. But God gave him chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. There's some of y'all sitting in here this morning. You almost, you almost had that wreck. You felt that heart flutter. You've heard about other people. You think, man, I better do something. I better do something. God, I'll never forget. I'm, I'm getting off my message this morning, but I'll just talk to you out of my heart my family growing up y'all heard me tell it a hundred times my mom was a Christian lived right all them years my dad when I was a teenager became an alcoholic 
He became an alcoholic just like everybody becomes one. A little drink here and a little drink there. That's why you better leave that stuff alone. You can't handle it. I can't handle it. And nobody else can. Daddy, I remember daddy kept a pint of whiskey underneath the, the sink in the house. And every night, just to settle his nerves, just to be able to sleep, he'd take a big drink of it. It might take him, it might take it 20 years to do it. But he finally got to where he'd laying in the bed drunk two weeks at a time. And I remember mom leaving the phone off the hook because his boss was calling, where's Lawrence? Where's Lawrence? Because my daddy didn't ever miss work. He didn't miss work throwing up, buddy. Walking the snow that deep, I mean, he's crazy. I mean, just, he did not miss ever, ever. Worked seven days a week. Like a dog, like an animal. And daddy, that alcohol got the best of him. And I'll never forget, before I got saved, my, my oldest sister had got married, Sandy, and her and her husband was fighting. He was, he was drinking. And they were fighting like cats and dogs. And my whole family just seemed like I found myself wanting to just leave the house because I was bothered when I was 16 because daddy was laying in the bed drunk. And it was embarrassing. We'd come to my ball games drunk. And uh, I just remember thinking, our family's gone to the dogs, man. Our family's blowed all to pieces. Sandy and her husband, Jerry, they would fight. And we never, you know, you worry about your daughter fighting with her husband. You didn't worry about it? Man, she, my sister Sandy was something else. She is really, 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 really smart and talented, right, draw pictures, I mean, sing, dance, she, I mean, you name it, you name it, she could do it. And he, she, they got in a fight at supper one time, and he busted one of the plates, so it thrown a plate up against the wall or something and busted it. So she takes a hammer and goes out and busts the windshield out of his truck. Bam, bam, busting his windshield out. So he got mad and started cussing and went and got, was going to get the shotgun. He said, I'll get the shotgun and shoot you. She took and took molasses and broke his shotgun down and poured them molasses down in that shotgun. You ain't going to shoot it like that if it's full of molasses. That's a redneck way to fight, buddy, I'm telling you. But that's the way she did. And I remember thinking, good night. And I was in sin. And I was sinning. I, ne I, never, I never drank. I never, never smoked i never done any drugs or anything like that because of playing basketball. They wouldn't let you. But I was in sin. And I don't know what was going to happen. Our family is just going all to pieces. And you know what the Lord did? The Lord sent a train through Nebo. An old man named Joe Parson came through preaching. And I believe with all my heart that God sent that man there as a last train. And he preached, and that's the revival I got saved in. I ain't got time to tell the whole story. I got saved. I went home that night, and I told Mom I got saved. She absolutely, we hugged. She hugged me. I said, Mom, I got saved. And she, and she was so happy. And immediately, my mom, that's how hallelujah, my prayers have been answered. I got started going to church. No, my, 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 my daddy thought, oh, my goodness. Now, uh, my, my daddy went down there and gave that guy, uh, gave that preacher $100. I didn't even know it. I didn't know that until about a year later. She, mom said, Danny, did you know Lawrence went down there and gave that preacher? Daddy, give a preacher money? My daddy would never give a preacher money. And they said, why'd you do that, Lawrence? And he said, well, I'd rather give it to him as a judge. Because he knew I was going to get in trouble. And I would have. And I got saved and started living for the Lord. And it wasn't long until the Lord called me to preach. And I said, I got called to preach. My dad said, oh boy, you going to be a preacher? I said, yeah, I'm going to be a preacher. And I'm going to give it everything I've got. 100%. All the way. And he said, all right. And Daddy come to hear me preach. And I, he thought, good night. My sister Sandy went to church on my first sermon. And I preached that first sermon at Nebo Baptist Church and Sandy came to hear me that night.
preacher Hollifield, if a young man got called to preach, he'd usually let him preach right after that to see, how, see if he could do it. And I preached, and she came to the altar and got saved. And my other sister, Debbie, she is already saved. She come and got right with the Lord. And they started going to church. And my brother-in-law, the one that was going to sh shoot her, we, it wasn't long to a soul winner, Bill, Brother Bill Long, one of the greatest old soul winners I ever knew in McDowell County, went and sat down and took the Bible and opened it up to my brother-in-law, and he got saved. Amen. Amen. My other brother-in-law, I led him to the Lord, jumped up and poured a six-pack of beer down the sink. Right there. It didn't take him 10 years to wonder if it was wrong or not. He got saved, got up, poured the beer down the sink where all beer needs to go. Can you hear y'all? Don't you sit there and claim you're all right. Uh, have you drunk? I'm telling you, brother. Listen, I, he got rid of it. And ladies and gentlemen, my family got right with God. Sandy started playing the piano. She led the youth choir. She, and she, she finally, when she died with cancer, when she was 30, 40 years old, and, uh, and it, it was so good, buddy. It was so good. On Father's Day, my whole family would be in the same room. Daddy got saved. I remember going in my daddy's room, and daddy would be laying there drunk, and his, his ankle sticking out of, of the cover. Didn't even know he was in the world. And I got down and put my foot on, on, on my hand on his foot. And I said, God, please don't let daddy die. Please don't let him die like this. God, don't let him die like this. Lord, don't let him die like this. And daddy got saved. He come through the house one morning, had a bag of uh, beer and liquor and all on, and he set it down on the kitchen table and said, that's it. That's what he said. Amen. He said, that's it. And I said, what? We was all sitting there and I said, we was getting ready to go preach on the street. On Saturday morning. And he said, I was on my knees in there in the middle of the night. And Daddy looks up and said, I felt it when it came. Amen. That wasn't much of a testimony, but that's all he knew. He couldn't read. He couldn't read. Mom taught him how to read and write just a little bit. And he didn't know signs. How would you like to be in this whole world? Not even, He somehow or another made it through. Made it through. He's smart. He's smart. But he wasn't educated. If you got your choice, take the smart. You're really bad off if you got education and dumb. But I'm telling you, people, God sent a train through Nebo, and there is no telling what would happen to my family if I hadn't got on that thing. That could have been our last chance. Me and my daddy both probably be in hell right now. Right now. I'm saying God sends services. God sends opportunities. God sends chances. And if you miss them, one day you're going to miss your last one. Don't sit there and think, well, I'm, I've got a lot going on right now. I'll, I'll get right with the Lord later. You better not think that. You know what God's last warning to these people was? Them animals getting on that boat. What do you think they thought when they come up there two by twos, seven by seven? Walking right in that boat. Whew. You talk about a warning. I believe the Lord's giving some people their last warning here this morning. I believe there could be somebody in here today. This could be your last chance. Are you saved? Do you know you're saved? I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how bad you've sank into sin. There's a God in heaven this morning to forgive your sins. Write your name in the book of life save you this morning if you'll come to him let's stand let's stand please every head bowed every eye closed missing God's last train missing God's last train every head bowed every eye closed I want you to bow your head and close your eyes this minute this morning I want to ask you a question two questions Question number one. If you died on your way home out there in a car accident on that interstate, do you know for a fact that you're saved and ready to meet the Lord? If your answer to that question is no or I don't know, you need to come and settle that thing this morning. Question number two. Are you saved? You're a Christian. You've been fooling around, messing around, and doing stuff that ain't right. You say, preacher, I, I'm going to mess around and get in trouble with God. He's going to give me one last chance one of these days, and I ain't going to listen. 
I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Preacher, I'm going to come to that altar this morning and I'm going to fix it, settle it with God. Let's do that today. I'm going to pray and I'm going to let you on the first verse of this song walk right out of your seat, get down here on your knees and let's settle this issue this morning, okay? Somebody be here to take the Bible and show you exactly what you've got to do to be saved. Come and get saved this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit of God, speak to hearts here today. Touch every single life. Lord Jesus, touch somebody this morning. Save them by your grace. Convict the hearts of sinners. Do what the Holy Ghost only can do. In Jesus' name we pray. And for his sake we ask it. Amen. Let's sing. Just come on, come on right now. Let's come and pray. I'd get out of my seat this morning. Make your way down here. Let's honor God. Come on. That's right. That's right. Come on. Up. Amen. What? So you mean me and pray this man Amen. And that thou bids me come. Come on, sir. Come on, young man. You know you need to come this morning. Come on right now. Amen. You know you need to come. Come on right now. That's good. That's good. Let's sing. Sing. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee. Come on. You need to come. Come on right now. Come on right now. Right now. Take that step. Take that step you need to make this morning. Get it right with God before you leave here. Get it right with the Lord. Amen. Let's sing another verse. Hell, why are we singing? Just as I am the will. Amen. 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 Will welcome part and cleanse relief. Hey. Because I promise I believe, oh, Lamb of God, I come. Amen. Everything settled. You can leave. You can leave here today. You can leave this room today and say, "Lord, everything's right. Nothing between my soul and the Savior." That's good. That's a good way to live. I told him last night. I can tell you how to die. Let me tell you how to die. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on books and counselors. I can tell you how to die. Die in Jesus Christ with a good conscience. Get everything right. That's the best way to die. Die in the Lord Jesus Christ with a clear conscience. You say, my conscience ain't clear, preacher. Clear it today. Clear it. You need to do something to clear it? Do it. Die with a clear conscience in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. All right. Now, a couple things right quick. Here's the sign-up sheet for the Sweetheart Banquet. We need to know who's going. So get up here and pray.